The fourth Eastern Economic Forum takes place in Russia from Tuesday to Thursday with representative delegations from over 60 nations. What's on the agenda and what can we expect from the meeting? Chinese President Xi Jinping will attend the forum and is expected to address its plenary session. It will be the first time for a Chinese president to participate. And the Chinese military has joined the Vostok 2018 War Games, the largest military exercise held by Russia. What is the current state of the China-Russia relationship? Both China and Russia have suffered from U.S. punishment, tariffs for China and sanctions for Russia. Yet it is said the dilemma can turn into an opportunity if countries suffering from U.S. measures can cooperate to create new opportunities to develop their economies. To what extent is this true? And what else can be done to counter U.S. economic pressures? Although DPRK leader Kim Jong-un will not attend the meeting, he sent a special envoy. With the inter-Korean summit on the way and the absence of long-range missiles on display in the military parade to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the founding of the DPRK, what is the current situation on the denuclearization for the Korean Peninsula? Hi there. Is this a story about the rumors of four kingdoms in Northeast Asia? The Fourth Eastern Economic Forum, hosted by Russian President Vladimir Putin, opens in Vladivostok in the Russian Far East. The high level delegations from more than 60 countries drew attention to the resources and opportunities in the Russian Far East. What do Russia and the attending countries hope to achieve at the conference? With Chinese President Xi Jinping meeting Vladimir Putin for the third time this year, what new impetus might come to the China-Russia Comprehensive Strategic Partnership? And what economic strategies will they adopt to cope with the current challenges and uncertainties arising from the presidency of Donald Trump? To discuss these issues and more, I'm very happy to be joined in the Beijing studio by former Prime Minister of Kyrgyzstan, Dilma Oktobayev, and Professor Zhang Gong from the University of Econ International Business and Economics. We shall also be joined on our satellite by Alexei Maslov, head of the School of Asian Studies at the National Research University Higher School of Economics in Moscow. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Rui. Welcome to Dialogue, gentlemen. It Thank seems you. President Putin has been pretty active on the center stage of world affairs. We have different images about Moscow. Russia, Europe, Russia, the Middle East, Russia, SEO, Russia with the India, and Russia with the China in the Far East. Of course, this time he is able to align himself with Japan, South Korea, and China for the purpose of uh, discussing economic rejuvenation of this region. Now, what do you think uh, of uh, the uh, proactive diplomacy of uh, President Putin? Uh, to my uh, modest knowledge, uh, Russia is not preferring one geographic region or another, but nobody can ignore the growing Asia, including the, its leader, China, and its huge border and enormous potential of joint economic and political development. This is very clear message of President Putin and upon his invitation, few other leaders of neighboring countries attending this Eastern Economic Forum, which is a remarkable fact on itself. It's the first time in history when the presidents of Russia, China, South Korea, and Japan meeting each other in such forum. So clearly, Russian Far East is underdeveloped and very uh, uh, populated, very uh, uh, not enough. Only 4.5% of Russian population live in huge area which occupied about 60% of territory of China. Uh, so it's a lot of potential and a lot of complementarity to make economic activities there. There's no question about the economic dynamics uh, for Northeast Asia. Look at the participation by uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and mm -hmm. President Moon Jae-in from our... Okay, the issue is... Uh, a massive uh, war game mm -hmm. took place to coincide, almost to coincide with right. the opening of the Far Eastern Economic Forum or Eastern Economic Forum, the fourth of its kind, for the first time in uh, Vladivostok. The location does matter. So what do you think of this dramatic uh, defining moment uh, for the new image that President Putin presents to the world? 
Yeah, this timing is actually you know, very interesting. I, I, I'm not sure there's a strategic message or strategic signal coming out of this by timing these two events together. And I have to also keep in mind that also China sends some troops over there to participate in this. 3,000 of them were sent to right. uh, participate <coughs> in this war game. Exactly, that's true. So, you know, the, the, this military drill, you know, what's the strategic implication, implication behind this? I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's maybe my guess is that it's probably pre planned already. It's just a coincidence. I hope it's a coincidence. Uh, but to, to some extent, it. Never underestimate <laughs> the sophistication <laughs> of those masterminds in uh, Moscow. Well, but I, I think <laughs> it, 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 I mean, it implies a message that is a very close relationship with, with Russia and China. And look at the relationship they describe. It's called comprehensive strategic partnership. This is something above what we had with the United States. Uh, this is something that of we course like the Chinese <coughs> are known for being able to close one eye and open the other about the strategic ambiguity of, mm -hmm. <laughs> of President Putin. Yeah, you know the U.S. up to the China-Russia relationship has a has a checkered history. We have to keep in that in mind. And there are still a lot of people in Russia that are uh, who are quite still quite suspicious of. You know, Chinese investment, Chinese people moving to this area. There's always this, you know, very deep thought behind in, in people's mind that is, a, you know, because of the history of this territory, and and to you know that factor needs to be weighed in when when we talk about you know these uh, strategic partnerships. I think bilateral trade did surge mm -hmm. in a bilateral relationship between Moscow and Beijing for one reason or another. There are good reasons for the two sides to enjoy the opportunities. The president. Put, uh, sorry, President Donald Trump presents, uh, unfortunately, it's a blessing for the two uh, economies of the BRICS group. Now, Your Excellency, other than the economic opportunities, uh, uh, we would rather focus on uh, challenges. It seems uh, to be a mistake, if not a reckless uh, mistake, by President Donald Trump to put Russia and China together at this moment uh, with uh, punishment for China but economic sanctions against uh, Russia after the takeover of uh, Crimea a few years ago. Now the challenges uh, lie ahead for uh, a new kind of uh, triangle to be formed in Northeast Asia but uh, you are a representative of Central Asia if not the SEO, Shanghai Corporation Organization. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the challenges? I wanted to start with this previous statement about suspicious mm. kind of feelings of Russian people, maybe Central Asian people about China. And I would like to start with a famous word of great uh, German philosopher Franz Kafka, who said that without trust, all other discussions are useless. Mm. So building trust, this is the key element of all policies. So. China, Russia should build trust. It's not simple history behind, but meeting of the leaders, meeting of the politicians, academia people, business circles should have the first goal to build real trust of the 21st century. That is why those meetings are so extremely important. And I would not say that this is friendship against someone. It's natural. Uh, development of the situation when nations which live for centuries and centuries close to each other starting to open new page of economic, political and cultural development. In that respect I would underline the role of so-called soft power. Power of knowing each other better, deeper, appreciating different cultures, different languages, different way of decision making. So if trust will be built fundamentally and on a high level, then it will be for many Obviously years. no easy job for the uh, critical players like Japan and South Korea to build consensus seizing this opportunity of the economic forum in the Far East. Now let me go to Mr. Alexei Maslov, a professor from a uh, prestigious university, National Research University in Moscow, for his comments on the Russian strategy. Hello, Mr. Maslov. What do you think of the implications of hosting Hello. this uh, economic forum in the Far East? What does that mean for the United States and uh, an opportunity for perhaps uh, Japan and China to introduce a thaw in their bilateral relationship since uh, the disputes on the territorial, uh, territory, uh, territorial integrity 
for example, concerning Diaoyu Island uh, um, flared up a few years ago? Uh, well, I really think that the location of this forum, especially in Vladivostok, has a very specific and maybe symbolic meaning for uh, Russia because it's the uh, uh, highest point, the extreme point of uh, Russian Federation. So it means that Russia still continue the global policy from the uh, western part to the eastern part. And uh, uh, let me remind you that it's the fourth forum. And the first was done just under the, uh, under the umbrella of the uh, Russian turning to the east. So it means to reconstruct the relations with Asia and especially to reconstruct uh, the uh, relation between Russian center, so it, so it means in Moscow, uh, to the uh, Russian Far East. So it means to uh, invest more money, more power, more capacity to Russian uh, Far East. So that's why mm, uh, for Russia this forum is not just a investment forum. It's not just a, mm, a kind of uh, discussion about the future of the uh, global world, of the uh, stability and uh, uh, development of the East and Southeast Asia. But first of all, it's a kind of declaration for, uh, for uh, Russia that uh, Russia is uh, one of the players in Asia markets, in Asia political uh, stage, and as well as uh, 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 the play for the future of the global world. President Obama says loud and clear that the United States remains a Pacific power, and likewise, President Putin made the same declaration. Mm -hmm. Russia has never left uh, this uh, uh, vast region. Oh, by the way, uh, Mr. Maslov, do you think it is the interesting issues on the agenda of President Putin or diplomacy on the sidelines of this multilateral diplomatic event that matters to the world media? Uh, well, uh, I think, uh, first of all, it's a mm, kind of individual stage for President Putin because he's a main player uh, in Vladivostok Forum. Uh, for him, it's very important to show that Russia is not in, a, in isolation. Russia has a, a capacity, uh, actually it's a building a capacity with uh, other Asian countries. Excuse like, me, uh, Professor Maslow, you spoke, uh, of, Japan, uh, you spoke of the alleged isolation yeah. of the Russian Federation. What do you mean precisely by isolation? Are you referring actually to the Crimea, to the economic sanctions that were imposed on Russia since uh, Crimea and Eastern Ukraine? Uh, well, I, actually, it's a, uh, it's, it's a bunch of uh, questions. First of all, it's, yes, it's a, uh, one of the main reasons it's Crimea. Another one, it's uh, anti-Russian sanctions, economic sanctions, and the isolation of Russian biggest companies uh, from uh, Western markets, first of all, from markets from, uh, of the United States. Another one, it's a partial isolation of the Russian financial system from uh, Western banks. So that's why well, one of the reasons why Russia decided to well, fastly and very rapidly turn to, the, uh, to Asia and first of all to reconstruct uh, all uh, economic and, and uh, well economic and social politics uh, to uh, up to uh, to Asia. Yes, that, I think that's isolation, and this isolation well, it's not really bad. It's uh, first of all, it's a kind of uh, new chance, new opportunity for Russia to maybe to rethink the economic policy and the, well, political trends. And first of all, maybe uh, to reconstruct uh, relations with China and with Japan uh, toward more investment and less trade. Yes, indeed. It is a matter of original integration between the Euro-Asian Economic uh, Union and the Belt and Road Initiative that President, put, uh, President Xi Jinping put forward. Um, let's look at uh, this opportunity for Tokyo. Uh, this year witnesses the 40th anniversary, the 40th anniversary of the landmark treaty on friendship and, and uh, peace um, between the two countries in Northeast Asia, Japan and China. Uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe went there and pretty soon he's going to visit our country and that's the first of its kind since the crisis surrounding Diaoyu Island. So do you think this is an opportunity for these two leaders, uh, Shinzo Abe and President Xi Jinping, to meet and uh, catch up? It will be absolutely great. It's the number two and number three economies in the world and they are so close to each other historically, territorially, mentally that it's very uh, unusual that they are still facing some political issues. 
So again, building trust. That is what I said in the beginning. It's absolutely but important I need to, element. Uh, perhaps we need to take a closer look at the broad context in which uh, these issues uh, uh, crop up. For example, uh, the U.S. pull out from TPP, uh, the uh, rejection by President Donald Trump of the Iran nuclear deal, right. and for that economic sanctions, I'm afraid all <coughs> key economic players like the European Union, um, Japan, uh, South Korea, and China are the casualty. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of uh, the uh, impact mm -hmm. of the unilateralism that uh, mm -hmm. President Donald Trump uh, put forward? I mean, I can clearly see a <coughs> change of policy gradually, a very gradual change of policy in Japan on uh, 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 Abe, Shinzo Abe. Now he is, I think, the first, pr first president went to the U.S. when Donald Trump was inaugurated in the hope of spe establishing a special relationship. But, you know, it one event after another, I think he realizes that Japan is not someone, it's not some country that the United States is going to take a special attitude towards. Look at the TPP. Um, look at the, the, um, the, uh, the Section 203 tariffs on steel and aluminum. Look at the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the tariffs on, uh, from China, uh, of which uh, Japan definitely has an implication towards them. So all these things, I think, contribute to the fact that the, the Japanese government realizes that you know, they have to develop their own strategy. They have to develop a more independent strategy away from the United States, uh, seeking cooperation, seeking opportunities with its neighbors in, uh, in Asia, especially in Northeast Asia. So I think you know, that's, a, that's a sort of a broader context. Um, I think some of the recent um, uh, events and some of the recent uh, newspaper editorials in Japan are pointing to that, uh, that uh, you know, Donald Trump is not someone that can be counted on uh, for sort of a special interest uh, from uh, from the United States towards Japan. It's not going to happen. I'm afraid the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe still licks the wounds of the four northern islands between Russia and Japan, a legacy of the Second World War. No peace treaty uh, has yet been signed between these two countries. Likewise, no such one or similar one has been reached uh, to replace the truce in Panmunjom between the two Koreas. Mm -hmm. Given these legacies of the Second World War, uh, this uh, region, Northeast Asia, remains the most volatile region next to the Middle East. So what do you think of the adversity, Mr. Maslow, for the two, uh, I mean, for all the key players in this region to build a consensus, uh, as uh, uh, Prime Minister Altabayev said earlier, it's an issue of uh, how to build the trust and reconstruct the consensus uh, so that we would keep a distance from the United States, as the social superpower which advocates uh, uh, overwhelmingly the principle of unilateralism, putting America first. Mr. Maslow? He can't hear me clearly. Yeah. Uh, well, I think. Oh yeah, right. Uh, my idea that uh, speaking from the Russian side about the situation, I think that Russia tries to diversify its connections uh, with Asia, because for the very long time the main, uh, maybe not the main, the only partner for Russia was only uh, China, and uh, Russia was so directed toward uh, trade with China cooperation with China, even military cooperation with China, that Russia even forgot about other countries and in this situation became very dependent from, uh, from uh, Chinese opinion and for example with trade with China. So right now Russia tries to find a new ideas, new ways uh, to cooperate with Japan and in this way uh, maybe for the uh, for the first time in a very long uh, period of, of time, Russia started to speak about the uh, peace treaty that uh, was uh, well, that's still under consideration and under the huge discussion and not completely co uh, the, uh, the supported by public opinion in Russia. Uh, I mean, the three peace treaty between Russia and uh, Japan. But at the same time, uh, Japan, from, from Japanese side, is really keen to invest to Russia, not in exchange to, um, uh, to this peace treaty, but as a first step to reconstruct uh, cooperation, to build a capacity, and then to turn back 
and return to the discussion about the peace treaty. Excuse and me, but I'm afraid, uh, President, uh, excuse me, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, got to keep in mind the issue of the Northern Islands uh, as well as, uh, for example, the abduction issue that he has with the DPRK. I, I, in this case, uh, what do you think of the uh, chance uh, for these two countries to normalize their relations, to pave the way for Japanese investment uh, in this region? Oh, well, uh, I think in this case, Russia and uh, Japan, I mean Putin and uh, Shinzo Abe, uh, have a completely different approach to the same problem. Because uh, for Russia, well, that's the an first issue step of domestic politics uh, individually for the two countries. The uh, domestic uh, politics. Uh, exactly, and if, uh, because uh, both countries domestic policies, because all politics, I mean, uh, Putin and Shinzo Abe uh, pay much attention to the public opinion. For example, for Putin, it's completely impossible to uh, cede a, at least two, uh, two, two islands, or not to, not, not to speak about four islands. And for Mr. Abe, it's very important to resolve this uh, question right now, I mean, under this, uh, and, 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 uh, during the life of this generation, not uh, to, to continue this problem up to the next generation. So it's, it's it's more political problem than economical, even to the territorial problem. I raise this issue, uh, Professor Maslov, uh, to divert your attention from uh, the bilateral diplomacy to the upcoming elections for the Liberal Democratic Party in Japan, the ruling party, the longest ruling party in this country since the end of the Second World War. And therefore, it doesn't come as a surprise for Prime Minister Shinzo Abe to address the issue of the territorial disputes. What do you think of the chance for seeking a solution in the immediate future? Uh, maybe, um, well, uh, about a couple of months ago, if you asked me this question, I told me there is not any positive solution for, uh, of this question uh, up to, well, during the next 100 years. But I feel that step by step, Russian position became much more flexible and much more, well, resolving. Uh, because, uh, first of all, Putin himself started, started to speak about the peace treaty, and he never mentioned this treaty officially as a uh, part of the Russian-Japanese relations. So it means that maybe, if uh, we follow the logic of this uh, cooperation, maybe after resolving of all economic problems, when we uh, get, get closer and maybe overlapping uh, Russian and Japanese economics in the Russian Paris, maybe the next step uh, will be peace treaty and as a part of this peace treaty, uh, maybe Russia will consider the uh, possibility to cede or maybe to uh, jointly uh, develop at least uh, two, uh, two islands in the Northern Territories. We understand your embarrassment uh, in using repeatedly words like uh, probably, flexible, uh, words like ambiguity in your diplomacy in the Far East. I understand your embarrassment because you uh. cannot articulate the vision of your president at this moment, but uh, let's look at the potentials, if any, between these two economies, the em two emerging markets, uh, Russia and China. Now, most of the time, Russia exports energy. Uh, uh, raw products uh, instead of uh, having a serious uh, mm -hmm. uh, I initiative about industrialization or uh, further investment uh, in such an uh, ambitious blueprint of industrializing the Russian economy. Since uh, President Obama and his predecessor mm -hmm. failed to reset their policy uh, with uh, Moscow. Now, many Chinese uh, mm -hmm. ask the same question, uh, Mr. Otobayev. How long can the economic collaboration between Moscow and Beijing would possibly last, uh, given the structural uh, problems? Um, of course, with the uh, economic sanctions imposed on Tehran, we see this, this opportunity to talk about the future of RMB. I'm not talking about the phasing out the, the use of the US dollars very quickly, and overnight. But uh, do you think uh, we have more challenges than opportunities when we look at into the future between Russia and China? You uh, very rightly mentioned about alignment between Eurasian Economic Union, which is Central Asia, Belarus, Armenia, plus Russia and uh, Belt and Road Initiative. I believe that this alignment is very natural and will last forever. 21st century it will be Asian century. 
In 10 years, uh, 50% of world GDP will be produced in Asia. You have excluded the prospect of a further raging trade war between Washington and Beijing because uh, that will prevent China from accounting more of the world GDP, despite uh, the fact uh, that China contributes up to 30% of the world economic recovery. Yeah, it will be, it's not feasible that it will be some kind of tensions. Mm -hmm. What I'm observing now that is trust building every day, every week. And you mentioned President Trump's name. We all in five years will say thanks to him because he making very clear to outside world where the current world is moving. So he said, please take care of yourself. Don't rely on dollar, don't rely on our chips, don't rely on our any trade, whatever. Do things yourselves. He is awake to all the world, all the world now moving in different direction, revolutionary, not evolutionary way, which is healthy for the world. So all world in few years will say thanks to Mr. Trump to wake up all us. Let's look at the other opportunities uh, that may arise uh, from the regional intervention scheme of President Putin and likewise. Uh, uh, Mr. Xi Jinping also put forward the idea of Belt and Road Initiative. This time around, Mr. Kim Jong-un, leader of the DPRK, failed to show up himself, but he sent a special yes. envoy to represent the DPRK government. Now, with the rapprochement and the momentum of this uh, process of uh, uh, denuclearization, do you think uh, the Tumen Delta region would be a cornerstone for the regional rejuvenation uh, since, uh, for example, the three northernmost provinces like Heilongjiang, Jilin and Liaoning would mm -hmm. seize this opportunity for revitalization of the investment that is badly needed mm -hmm. since we have this uh, notorious assumption investment from in, inside China right. would never go beyond right. uh, you know the, the Shanghai yeah. Guan. Yeah. Um, I, I think um, you know let's first talk about the Russian economy it's still actually quite small in size I mean the, the Russia China trade is, is something less than a hundred billion dollars it's only one eighth of the sino US trade so in terms of the size it's quite small now in terms of investment it's also even smaller um, but I see a lot of potential still but I think the problems in Russia right now um, actually in a way quite similar to what we see in the northern provinces, northeastern provinces in China. It's the institutional environment. Uh, you know, Chinese businessmen uh, doing business in trade and investment in Russia in the past haven't been, you know, uh, have a kind of a very pleasant experiences that they have, for example, in other countries. So I think the Russian side needs to address these issues. I mean, they have plenty of resources, they have plenty of uh, other other natural resources, but um, but but you know, we, they have to improve the uh, investment environment, sort of in a constitu in an institutional sense. Um, I I mean the. Russian Russian economy right now produces mostly energy products. I see some uh, prospect of um, agricultural products uh, imported into China. China is looking for an alternative, alternative market, market to replace the soybeans that right. we import <coughs> right. from the United States since exactly. the war started. Exactly. Um, you know, it reminds me of uh, Rex Tillerson's famous statement that Russian economy is nothing more than a gas station. Right? I think there are other things. Um, uh, well, he said even even worse than that, but <coughs> I'm not going to quote his word. But um, uh, but I think there are opportunities for, for example, Chinese investments to uh, to go into Russia's far east to, for example, contract large amounts of land to do agricultural stuff. Um, and it is something that Russians are concerned about. In the past, they are. They are concerned about this model. But I think, you know, speaking of trust, if you have trust built up gradually over time, and I think um, there is a prospect that uh, the Far East, Russian Far East, can be developed into a uh, agricultural base uh, for... Thank uh, you so it's, much. It's so what you neighbor. say is probably related more to the first movement of Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto <laughs> to hopefully <laughs> revitalize our hopes. Thank you very much for being with us. And I, I think uh, there is, of course, a bright future, but uh, President Trump says, give a second thought. <laughs> I'll see you next time. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>